Okay, good morning everybody um, and welcome to Archer's Autumn 2024 case law update. Um, the first slide on your screen here shows your presenters for this morning. Um, so firstly, uh, myself, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Carolyn Porter. I'm a partner at Archer. I specialise predominantly in construction disputes, um, but I also do do some uh, ad hoc advice to varying clients throughout the lifetime of uh, projects. With me today, I have Lucy Day. Good morning. Lucy is an associate within our team, um, and Lucy works across both our contentious and non-contentious departments. Um, and also Amelia Formoy. Good morning. Um, Amelia is a trainee at Archer, um, and Amelia also works across our contentious and non-contentious departments, um, probably with a bit more focus at the moment on non-contentious matters. So for those of you who may not know Archer, uh, we are a boutique construction law firm. We were founded in 2021 and we specialise in all things construction. So we deal with complex uh, disputes that are resolved either through litigation um, or adjudication. Uh, we also do some arbitration work. We do development work and we give commercial support to um, varying parties throughout the life cycle of projects and beyond. Archer is actually an acronym of the six partners names um, and on the slide here you can see Andrew Rush, our senior partner, Ruth Kavanagh, our managing partner and then we have myself, Hannah, Ollie and Rory. Archer um, is now lucky enough to have a team of 24, um, soon to be 2025, next month. And within the team, 21 of those individuals are fee earners. Um, this slide shows some of the wider team that we have here at Archer. Uh, and you may be familiar with some of the people shown on screen. Um, as I said, we've got a wide variety of individuals working from a legal director level um, down to paralegal. So enough about Archer and our sets move on to what we are going to talk to you about today. Um, so as I said, this is an autumn case law update. And today we are going to talk to you about nine recent cases that we feel are of importance to the construction industry. So each of us speakers are going to discuss with you three cases each. And then at the end of the talk, there will be an opportunity for answer any questions that you may have. If you do have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat function. So on to the first case is one of mine. This is the case of Little Great Britain Limited versus Closed Circuit Cooling Limited. Um, now Closed Circuit Cooling Limited actually traded as 3CL. So I will refer to them as 3CL going forwards for ease. So in this case, Lidl contracted with 3CL, who were a refrigeration and air conditioning contractor, under a framework agreement whereby Lidl could instruct 3CL to carry out various works under separate orders at different sites as and when required. Um, the parties fell into dispute and this resulted in a series of adjudications being commenced. The first adjudication was a smash and grab adjudication, uh, and that was referred by 3CL. The second adjudication related to costs incurred by Lidl in remedying defective works carried out by 3CL, um, and that was referred by Lidl. And then the third adjudication related to um, 3CL's true entitlement to an EOT, um, but that was also referred by Lidl. Um, the third adjudication was interesting because Lidl was effectively seeking a declaration that 3CL was not entitled to any additional EOT. Um, and you may be aware it's relatively rare for an employer to start an adjudication of this nature. Normally you would see a contractor starting an extension of time adjudication and seeking the extension of time that it wanted. Um, I don't have precise details of the nature of the adjudication. Um, it wasn't reported within the judgment, but I suspect that here Lidl thought they might catch 3CL on the back foot by commencing the adjudication um, within a time frame that suited Lidl. 
Um, the referring party was successful in each adjudication. So basically 3CL won the smash and grab, but Lidl won the costs of remedying defective works and Lidl also won in relation to the extension of time dispute. However, when Lidl tried to enforce decisions two and three, um, 3CL objected. The reason that 3CL objected was that when the second and third adjudications were commenced, the sum due to 3CL under the first adjudication, so the sum due under the smash and grab, had not been paid. And therefore, 3CL argued that the second and third decisions lacked jurisdiction um, and they relied on the Grove principle. So for those of you who may not be familiar with the Grove principle, um, the court held in the case of Grove against S&T that a paying party which is subject to a smash and grab adjudication must pay the notified sum before it can commence what is referred to as a true value adjudication. So the decision in Grove put an end to um, a relatively short period of uncertainty where parties had effectively reverted back to the good old days before CVIC and ISG um, and smash and grabs weren't seen as too much of a threat because the payer would simply commence a true value adjudication in reverse and then set off the two adjudication decisions. And Grove put a stop to that and confirmed that no, a smash and grab decision has to be paid before a party can commence a true value adjudication in reverse. So applying Grove to this case, 3CL said that Lidl could not commence any adjudication until it had paid the sum due to 3CL under the smash and grab. And so the adjudicator did not have jurisdiction to decide the second or third adjudications. Um, in the alternative, 3CL that Grove, uh, sorry, 3CL said that Grove meant that no adjudication could be commenced if it sought to undermine the payment obligations in the smash and grab. Lidl said Grove only prohibited a true value adjudication in respect of the same payment cycle as the notified sum adjudication and therefore Grove didn't apply to prevent the second and third adjudication decisions from being enforced. Now, somewhat unsurprisingly, the court held that there is no general bar to adjudication, even if a previous smash and grab has not been paid. Now, I say this is unsurprising because Grove itself received some criticism for being potentially contrary to Parliament's intention that a party should have a right to adjudicate at any time. It was clearly, therefore, in the court's interests in this case not to let Grove grow legs. The court held, therefore, that Grove only applies to subsequent adjudications which cover claims which could have been the subject of a pay less notice against the notified sum that was the subject of the smash and grab. So basically, if any subsequent claim could have been raised in defence of the notified sum by way of a pay less notice, it was covered by Grove and that adjudication could not proceed until the smash and grab had been paid. Now, in practice, the outcome of this is a little bit messy. Um, in Lidl and 3CL, um, the court managed to sever the adjudicator's decision in relation to um, the costs of remedying defective works. And the court found that some of those costs could have been raised in a pay less notice um, and therefore um, was covered by the Grove principle. But some of those costs had arisen after that payment cycle and therefore were capable of being referred to adjudication. And so the court severed that decision and part of the monies were found to be due. Um, in relation to the extension of time decision, the court effectively said it would be possible in theory to sever that also so that the court could only enforce parts of the extension of time decision that didn't relate to the relevant payment cycle period. Um, however, the court found in practice that was too difficult and therefore the decision was found to be unenforceable. 
Um, now, moving forward, this case is a real warning to anyone wanting to refer any dispute to adjudication if a smash and grab has not been paid. I think in practice, um, advice is always going to be that a smash and grab has to be paid uh, before a subsequent adjudication is commenced, unless that subsequent adjudication is something entirely separate um, to the subject of that smash and grab. Um, so the lessons in this to be learnt, as always, um, give notices. Don't get in your position where you are on the wrong side of a smash and grab in the first place. So I'll now pass over to Lucy for her first case. Good morning, everyone. And um, the first case that I am going to take a look at is Wordsworth Construction Management Limited versus Innovos Limited, who are trading as health spaces. And Archer actually acted for Innovos in this matter. This case looks at what happens when two applications for enforcement of adjudication decisions that arise under the same contract go before the TCC. So Wordsworth Construction Management Limited were obviously a construction manager and Innovos was the contractor. Both brought separate adjudications under the same contract. In the first, Innovos was ordered to pay just over 170,000 to Wordsworth. In the second, Wordsworth was ordered to pay Innovos just under 198,000. Each party then sought to have their decisions enforced and they argued that the other decision should be unenforceable. This was because on the face of it, the decision in each adjudication contradicted the reasoning given in the other. When looking at this, the judge noted that if the second adjudication decision is a decision on matters which are the same, or substantially the same as those decided by the adjudication number one decision, then the later decision is unenforceable. Although the judge considered that the adjudicator in the first adjudication had in fact made an error of law by dismissing Innovos's counterclaims on the basis that Innovos had repudiated the contract, it didn't go far enough to be considered a breach of natural justice. The judge considered that adjudication number one was therefore enforceable. The second adjudication dealt with the same counterclaim as the one that was dismissed in the first. The adjudicator in the second adjudication decided that he still had jurisdiction to deal with those issues raised in the second. When determining whether the second adjudication was also enforceable, the judge concluded that the second adjudicator considered issues which had not been sufficiently determined in the first. Um, and these were things such as dealing with the merits um, or quantum of individual breaches of contract, um, specifically when dealing with the termination aspect. So the judge considered that the second adjudication was also enforceable and following both decisions being found enforceable, the parties agreed to set off the decisions. So in summary, this case is a bit of a reminder that the courts will seek to enforce adjudication decisions wherever possible, even in circumstances where the adjudicator has been found to have made an error in applying the law. And the grounds for challenging a decision remain limited and as shown on the screen. Um, and these are that one, the adjudicator had no jurisdiction to give a decision, or two, that there was a material breach of the rules of natural justice. Now I will pass you over to Amelia. Thank you, Lucy. The next case that I would like to bring your attention to is that of Abbey Healthcare Limited v Augusta 2008, formerly known as Simply Construct. And throughout this PowerPoint presentation, I will be referring to them as Simply. So Abbey was the tenant and it operated a care home designed and built by Simply in 2015. Practical completion of the works was achieved in 2016. However, a dispute arose in 2018 due to cladding and fire safety defects, which were completed in 2020. In 2020, Abbey and Simply entered into a collateral warranty in relation to the works. Now, a collateral warranty is a promise by a contractor or a subcontractor or a consultant to carry out its obligations under a building contract or under an appointment for the benefit of a third party who has an interest in the project but was not party to the underlying agreement. 
So it's simply warranted to Abbey that it has performed and will continue to perform its obligations under the building contract. Both Abbey and the freehold owner commenced separate adjudication proceedings against Simply seeking damages for roughly £1 million each. Now the key issue in this case was whether a collateral warranty could be constituted as a construction contract under the Housing Grants Construction and the Generation Act 1996, commonly known as the Construction Act. Now, to constitute as a construction contract, section 104 of the Construction Act is to be applied, and this states that a construction contract is an agreement for the carrying out of construction operations. Now, depending on whether a collateral warranty would be categorised as a construction contract, impacts whether the party has an automatic right to adjudicate. If the warranty would be classed as a construction contract, then the statutory provisions of the Act would apply and the adjudicator's award would likely be enforced against Simply. If not, then the adjudicator would not have jurisdiction and the award against Simply would not be able to be enforced. So this case started in the TCC and finally ended up in the Supreme Court. And in the TCC, it was found that a collateral warranty did not constitute as a construction contract, as it did not fall into the definition set out in the Act. And the TCC found that a collateral warranty was not a construction contract because the nature of the obligation only warranted to the work which was already completed, opposed to any future works. The collateral warranty was issued after practical completion, which indicated that it was not a contract to perform construction work. And finally, it was deemed that the purpose of the warranty was to provide assurance about the completed works rather than the future construction operations. In the Court of Appeal, the majority decided that a collateral warranty was a construction contract. However, this depended on what was being warranted. And this followed the judgment in Parkwood, which made clear that if the wording warranted was to positively carry out construction operations, the warranty would likely be a construction contract. But if they warranted to a previous state of affairs, then it would not be classed as a construction contract. And finally, in the Supreme Court, it was confirmed that a collateral warranty was not a construction contract. So the key point to take away here is that the promise under the warranty was a derivative promise. Simply were promising to Abbey what it had already promised to the employer under the building contract. So the collateral warranty did not give rise to separate and distinct undertakings for the carrying out of construction operations. So in conclusion, most collateral warranties will not be considered to be a construction contract, provided that what is being warranted goes no further than the obligations under the building contract. And it's important to note that should a beneficiary under a warranty wish to benefit from the statutory adjudication provisions, then this should be expressly stated as a contractual right. I'll now pass it over to Carolyn. Thanks, Amelia. So the second case I'm going to talk to you about is the case of Bellway Homes Limited against Sergo Construction. Um, now this case touches on the well-known rule that only one dispute can be referred to adjudication um, and the courts looked at that rule in light of payment adjudications. So Sergo actually appointed a company called Roundall Manufacturing Limited uh, to supply and fit kitchens in a residential development. In December 2019, Roundall applied for payment under its contract. No payment or pay less notice was issued, um, and so Roundall proceeded to adjudication. Now, the key document in an adjudication is the notice of adjudication, because that is the document that defines the dispute um, and therefore the adjudicator's jurisdiction. Uh, jurisdiction. For a uh, simple smash and grab, notices often make clear that payment of the notified sum is being sought and the adjudicator does not have jurisdiction to value the works. In this case, however, Roundel did not commence um, a simple smash and grab. Rather, Roundel's notice of adjudication sought a decision on a smash and grab basis, or failing that, if Roundel lost the smash and grab, 
round will ask the adjudicator to decide on a true value basis the sum that may be due to round all. And the adjudicator held the smash and grab failed, but on a true valuation, round all was due to be paid £146,000. Um, Roundall then assigned its rights to those sums awarded to it to Bellway. Um, Sergo didn't pay and therefore Bellway started enforcement proceedings and Sergo resisted the enforcement. Um, Sergo resisted enforcement on the grounds that two disputes had been referred to adjudication. Now you will likely be familiar with the scheme, but just to recap, uh, paragraph 1 1 of part 1 of the scheme confirms that only one dispute can be referred to adjudication at any one time. Now, Sergo said that by Roundel openly referring a smash and grab or a true value adjudication in the alternative, only if that smash and grab failed, Roundel had referred two disputes. Um, Sergo therefore argued that the decision was unenforceable. The court, however, held that only one dispute had been referred. Um, the dispute referred was Roundel's right to payment under an application. And the court held this because the notice of adjudication simply allowed the dispute to be determined in more than one way. So the court found the dispute was the right to be paid. Um, that could be determined by a smash and grab or by a true valuation. There was a clear link between the smash and grab and the true valuation because both related to the sum due under an application. And the court held that the courts shouldn't be too legalistic when determining what is a single dispute and dispute should be determined broadly. Now, the courts have regularly taken the approach that one dispute can be interpreted quite widely. And so this judgment was no real surprise to the industry. Um, I think it will, however, give some comfort to practitioners to definitively know that this approach is acceptable. Um, we certainly have seen this approach be taken in adjudications previously, um, but there's been no judicial authority as to whether or not such approach was acceptable. Um, in practice, I consider it's um, likely that this approach will rarely be used. Um, I suppose the likelihood of it being used will be if there is a small chance that a smash and grab may be successful. Um, some referring parties may decide to draft the notice in this manner to cover off all angles and to ask an adjudicator effectively to have to check first whether a smash and grab may succeed, but failing that to then go on and value the account. Um, the message that comes out of this case is that care should be taken when drafting notices of adjudication, um, not only with respect to if you want to refer a dispute of this nature, but also if you want to make sure that if you want to purely refer a smash and grab, um, that an adjudicator is not inadvertently given jurisdiction to value works. Um, so the message is beware when drafting notices of adjudication. I'll now pass you back to Lucy for her second case. So the next case that I'm going to talk to you about is Dawn Vale Calf Components Limited versus Hilga Properties Limited. And you might think this next case is aimed specifically at lawyers. However, it's not, I assure you, if you've been involved in any settlement negotiations that might have resulted in um, a settlement agreement or a Tomlin order, then this case will be of interest to you. So this case is about um, a dispute that concerned the interpretation of a Tomlin order um, that was entered into between Dawn Vale and Hilga. The main issue here was whether the Tomlin order prevented Hilga from issuing a subsequent adjudication for further losses which were said to stem from the same repudiatory breach as the first adjudication. Hilga was a property developer that in February 2020 engaged Dawn Vale services for the design, supply and installation of m and &E works at a site in Wirral. And the party's relationship unfortunately broke down in or around October 2020 and this led to the contract being terminated in the November 2020. 
As is often the case, both parties accuse the other of repudiating the contract. Hilger then commenced a true value adjudication, following which the adjudicator found that Dornvale had committed the repudiatory breach. And so he determined the true value of the works that had been carried out. The result of that was a decision that required Dornvale to pay Hilger for its overpayment and to pay the adjudicator's fees. It won't come as a surprise to you that Dornvale failed to pay, so Hilger had to enforce the decision plus interest and costs in the TCC. In August of 2021, the enforcement proceedings were then settled by way of a Tomlin order, which was on the following terms. As you can see in the slide, the Tomlin order said, all further proceedings in this action should be stayed upon the terms set out in the schedule here too. And then the schedule said, the payment of the settlement sum is in full and final settlement of any and all claims the claimant may have against the defendant arising from or in connection with these proceedings. Hilger then sought to recover further losses arising from the same repudiatory breach of contract. And this was by way of a letter of claim um, in August 2023. And the letter of claim threatened to refer the new claim to adjudication again. The new claim was for consequential losses that arose from Dornvale's repudiatory breach. Unsurprisingly, Dornvale issued Part 8 proceedings to try and dispose of that new claim. Um, the basis for this was that, in their view, it was barred by the Tomlin order. However, in court, the court said that the language used concluded that the new claim did not arise from the original proceedings, nor was it connected with the original proceedings. The court said that if the parties had intended to settle all potentially future related claims, the Tomlin order should have used language such as claims arising from the contract or the dispute rather than the proceedings. The court said that the purpose of paragraph four in the schedule was to prevent Hilger from re-arguing the true valuation of Dornvale's works. Hilger remained entitled to refer the new claim to adjudication. So in summary, this should be a reminder to us all um, especially those of us who are involved in settlement negotiations, that we need to be using precise language in any settlement agreements, um, especially if it is your intention to prevent any future claims whatsoever. I'll now pass you back to Amelia. The next case that we are to review is Tata Consultancy Services Limited, the Disclosure and Borrowing Service. So this case is a key case for parties that seek to recover either compensation for delays or delay damages and the rules concerning condition precedents. So in this case, Mr Justice Constable stressed the importance and the overriding principle that whilst every contract must be construed according to its own terms, there are some relevant factors the court will take into account. So some key points that the court will consider. The language of the obligation is necessary, but not sufficient. For example, the word shall shows an express intention, although this is not necessary. Additionally, the absence of the phrase condition precedent does not mean that there is not one within the contract. Further, the absence of any language which expresses a clear intention is a significant indicator that the parties did not intend the clause to operate as a condition precedent. And finally, the clearer the articulation, purpose and feasibility of the requirements to be complied with, the more consistent it will be with, depending on the rest of the language used within the contract, that the requirement forms part of the condition precedent regime. So to see how the court applied these principles practically, the court referred to clause 5.6. So clause 5.6 states that DBS shall not be liable to compensate TCS for delays to which clauses 7 or 8 apply unless TCS has fulfilled its obligations set out in and in accordance with clauses 5.1, 5.2 and 5.3. So the wording of this clause had the effect of making compliance with clauses 5.1 to 5.3 a condition precedent to any entitlement to compensation under clauses 7 or 8 due to the plain language that was used. I will now pass you back to Carolyn. Thanks, Amelia. 
Um, so the last case that I'm touching on this morning is Providence Building Services Limited uh, versus Hexagon Housing Association Limited. This case concerns the termination provisions within a JCT DMB contract. Uh, the Court of Appeals ruling in this case has definitely attracted a lot of attention and it does appear to have worried some employers. Um, I do think that the judgment was correct, however, on the facts. Um, so let's have a look at this case. So Providence were appointed under a JCT DMB to carry out a residential development. But there were two reported late payments made by Hexagon under that contract. The first late payment related to payment notice number 27. <clears throat> Excuse me. So payment notice number 27 required Hexagon to pay Providence £260,000 by the 15th of December 2022. Um, Hexagon did not pay on time, and so Providence served a notice of default under clause 8.9.1 of the contract. Now, notice of default under the JCT suite effectively gives the employer a certain amount of time to remedy a specified default before the contractor can then take any further steps, such as termination. Uh, the unamended JCT DMB gives an employer 14 days to remedy a default, but in that case, that sorry, in this case, that time period was amended to 28 days. Um, the important point to note here is that X Hexagon paid payment notice number 27 before the 28-day period within the notice of default had expired. And so no further action was taken by Providence in respect of the late payment. Um, and indeed, no further action could be taken by Providence in respect of that late payment because Hexagon had paid um, within that period. However, five months later, the same issue happened again. So payment notice number 32 required Hexagon to pay Providence £360,000. Um, again, Hexagon didn't pay on time. However, in this case, rather than issuing a further notice of default, Providence terminated their employment under the contract with immediate effect pursuant to clause 8.9.4. And Providence said that the contract allowed them to do this because it was not the first time that Hexagon had been late in making payment. So just to refresh our memories on what the JCT actually says. Firstly, as I said, clause 8.9.1 deals with notices of default. Um, in this instance, the default was late payment. So the specific clause is 8.9.1.1. Um, and that clause provides that if the employer does not pay by the final date for payment, the amount due to the contractor, the contractor may give the employer notice specifying that default. The next relevant clause is a clause 8.9.3 and 8.9.4. Um, now, just to make clear, the clauses on the slide here have been slightly amended from the um, JCT precedent. Um, however, the amendments are minimal. I have shown the amendments um, in pink on this slide, and you can see the only amendment is the actual um, time period. So, as I said, the uh, standard JCT wording states 14 days, but the parties in this instance had agreed to extend that time period to 28 days. Um, but otherwise, the clauses are exactly the same as the standard wording in the JCT. So 8.9.3 says that if the employer does not then remedy the default, so in this instance, pay the contractor within the required time period, which here is 28 days, the contractor can then issue a further notice um, of termination. So all OK so far. That is generally accepted practice, and I, I don't think that has ever been in dispute. Um, the key clause is the next clause, which is clause 8.9.4. Now, clause 8.9.4 states that if the contractor has not terminated under 8.9.3, but the employer repeats the breach, the contractor can terminate immediately. 
So there is no need to issue another notice of default. This case originally went to the High Court um, and the court said that Providence was wrong to terminate under 8.9.4 because Hexagon paid the first late payment within the 28 day period. And so the right to terminate under 8.9.3 never arose. However, this was overturned by the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal said that it was irrelevant that the right to terminate never arose before. Therefore, it was irrelevant that payment was made within the 28-day period before. Rather, all that is relevant is that a default has occurred again. And the key words that the Court of Appeal relied on in Clause 8.9.4 was the wording, for any reason. Now, I'm just going to flick back to the clause for, um, for your ease, and you can see the wording in clause 8.9.4 there. It states, um, if the contractor, for any reason, does not give the further notice referred to in 8.9.3. Um, and therefore, the Court of Appeal had held that it is irrelevant um, that the contractor in this instance couldn't issue termination notice under 8.9.3 because that right never arose because the employer play, paid within the 28-day period. Um, 8.9.4 clearly states it doesn't matter whether that right never arose and it doesn't matter, matter why that right never arose because if the breach is repeated, 8.9.4 gives a separate standalone right to terminate immediately. Therefore, the termination was valid. Um, now, this is a stark warning to any employers who may have received a notice of default in the past, because any subsequent late payments will give rise to the right to automatic termination. Now, it remains to be seen whether this may be used vexatiously in the future. For example, technically now, if there are two payments made one day late over the period of a long project, a contractor does have the right to terminate with immediate effect, as long as a notice of default was issued in relation to the first late payment. Um, it remains to be seen how the courts may approach that. But in practice, we expect to see this clause amended by employers moving forwards. I'll now pass on to Lucy. Thanks, Carolyn. So the last case that I'm going to be um, talking to you about today is the case of McLaughlin and Harvey Limited v LJJ Limited. And this case um, serves as a reminder for those involved in disputes about what adjudicators are entitled to amend in their decisions under the slip rule. And as many of you will know, the slip rule is contained in paragraph 22A of the scheme, and it says that the adjudicator may correct his decision so as to remove clerical or typographical errors arising by accident or omission. Usually these clerical or typographical errors are typically a typo, um, use of an incorrect party name, or a calculation error within a decision. It should not be an opportunity, however, for an adjudicator to correct an omission. Neither should it be an opportunity to correct errors that go to the intention or reasoning forming the basis of the decision. Now, the original decision in this case um, was produced in October 2023, and it decided that LJJ, who was an m and &E contractor, should pay McLaughlin £808,000 which was for LJJ's failure to meet key dates under the party's subcontract. The project in question was a contract for MEP installations as part of the fit out of a London office development. As is usually the case, the adjudicator invited the parties to notify him of any clerical or typographical errors. LJJ proceeded to make what the court later acknowledged were almost submissions on matters that it felt were not addressed during the adjudication. And these went so far as to produce evidence that was not served during the adjudication. Those submissions were later found to be incorrect, but that is a separate point. Even though LJJ's submissions did not correct any typographical or clerical errors, the adjudicator accepted them and produced a revised decision whereby McLaughlin were to be paid 808,000 
if not already allowed. LJJ didn't pay this, so McLaughlin enforced the original decision on the basis that the revised decision meant that the adjudicator had exceeded his jurisdiction under the slip rule, and therefore it didn't supersede the original decision. Unsurprisingly, the court found that the adjudicator in question had gone too far. The court said that LJJ's submissions were not clerical or typographical, and that the slip rule did not provide any power to correct the original decision in light of those submissions. McLaughlin was entitled to enforce the original decision, and the court found that the adjudicator had exercised a power that he did not have by seeking to clarify or qualify his original decision. The court acknowledged that if it were to enforce the revised decision, this would open the floodgates to others seeking to amend decisions via additional submissions after a decision has already been made. This would contravene the purpose of adjudication and, as you can imagine, would make the process very drawn out. So to summarise, this is a good reminder um, this case to all parties involved in adjudication about the limits of what can be corrected under the slip rule and the importance of adhering to that. And so for our last case, I will pass you back to Amelia. Thank you, Lucy. The final case that we will be reviewing in this webinar is that of a &V Building Solutions Limited versus j &V Hopkins Limited. So j &V engaged a &V to carry out mechanical and electrical engineering works. A dispute arose which related to a &V's interim application, which was named to both parties as application 14. The net amount due to AMV under the application was £211,773.60. The application was sent to JMV on Monday the 22nd of March 2021, yet it was dated on Sunday the 21st of March 2021. And at this point in time, JMV considered that at the date of the application, no further sums were owed to AMV. On the 17th of November 2020 AMV commenced adjudication proceedings, seeking payment of that full sum, plus VAT, interest and fees based off of the application 14. Now, in the first adjudicator's decision on the 19th of January 2022, it was found that application 14 was valid. Yet, despite it being valid, JMB failed to pay the sums owed to AMV. And whilst the adjudication was ongoing, on the 2nd of December 2021, JMB issued Part 8 proceedings against AMV, and they sought a declaration of invalidity of Application 14 and validity as to their own payment notice on the 16th of April 2021. Now, there were two key issues for the court to consider here. The first was whether the Part 8 proceedings constituted as an abuse of process. And secondly, whether application 14 was a valid interim application. So the key point to take away here is that general and bespoke clauses. With reference to this, the court considered that where there are contradicting general and specific provisions in a contract, the bespoke and specific clauses should be given more weight and more significance than general clauses. And the terms set out in Appendix 6 were bespoke clauses, and following this method of payment application, provided that this was followed, in which case it was, the application was in accordance with this and therefore it was valid. The valuation date was the 31st of March 2021 and in accordance with Appendix 6 of the contract, the interim application had to be made no later than seven days prior, that being the 24th of March, to be valid and in this case it was. In relation to the Part 8 proceedings, the court deemed that the Part 8 application was valid and was not an abusive process to avoid paying. However, considering that JMB failed to pay the sums owed to AMV in the first adjudication and yet proceeded to make that Part 8 application, it goes against the general principle that all parties to a construction contract must follow, and that is the pay now and argue later approach. They were therefore in breach of contract. 
So a key point here to take away is that contractors should be aware that where there are specific payment <coughs> schedules in a contract, these prevail over the general payment schedules. Thanks, Amelia. Um, so that is the end of the nine cases that we wanted to talk to you about this morning. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in, which I shall run through now. Um, and if anybody else has any additional questions and we've got some time at the end, please do put them in the chat function and we can look at them either now or um, subsequently after this webinar and we can get back to you in due course. Um, so the first question that we have had is, does the Providence Hexagon right to termination only arise in a DMB contract? Um, so that's um, a relatively straightforward one to answer. Um, the answer is no, in brief. Um, the right applies across the entire JCT suite, um, and it also applies in the new 2024 suite. Um, clause 8.9 um, hasn't been amended in the new 2024 suite, and so it is a right that is here to stay. Um, the next question that we've had is, could a contractor suspend instead of terminating if more than one payment was late? Um, now, that's a good question, actually. Um, it's important to note, first off, that the two rights are entirely separate. So a contractor can suspend on giving seven days notice if a payment is late. Um, and a contractor can suspend multiple time, times throughout the course of a project if multiple payments are late. Um, now, the right um, to issue notices of default and potentially termination notices um, is um, entirely separate to this. So it can be used in addition to suspension rights or instead of. So a contractor may want to issue a notice of default at the same time as suspending, um, or a contractor may simply want to just suspend um, and, and see potentially how things go. Um, the right to termination under 8.9.4 only arises though if a notice of default has been issued in respect of a previous late payment. Um, so that's just the key point to bear in mind that you can't terminate under 8.9.4 unless you have previously issued a notice of default in relation to a previous late payment um, and suspension runs alongside that. Um, the final question I think that we've got at the moment is how can you prevent an adjudicator considering a true value um, if you just want to commence a smash and grab? Um, so the, the key to this is the wording um, that you insert into the notice of adjudication. Um, so what we tend to do is that we expressly ask the adjudicator to determine that a notified sum is due. Um, and it's important not to give the adjudicator jurisdiction to find that any other sum is due. Um, we also tend to expressly state that uh, the adjudicator does not have jurisdiction to go on and value the works. Um, obviously, um, if the parties now want to, or if the referring party now wants to, it is open to referring party to um, refer that dispute in the alternatives to give an adjudicator the opportunity to, to determine it both ways. Um, but if not, I think the key, as I said, is to, um, to, to make it clear that it's the notified sum that is due or nothing, um, and to, to make clear to the adjudicator at the outset that he, um, he or she does not have jurisdiction um, to value the works. Um, so we don't appear to have any further questions in the chat function. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. Um, if, if you do have any queries arising from today or any queries in relation to anything else construction related that you think we may be able to assist you with, please do feel free to reach out. Um, all of our contact details are on the website, um, as are all of the details of the wider team. So um, thank you very much for joining us um, and I uh, hope to speak to you soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank Have you. a good day. Thank you. Bye.